Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tolman. Welcome to another episode of Talk Dizzy to Me. I'm Dr. Danielle Tolman, and as always, joined by Dr. Abby Ross. We are a vestibular physical therapist, and Abby is also a neuroclinical specialist. And today, we are so excited to have Jeff Walther and Dr. Azaredo from the Otolaryngology Vestibular and Balance Center at Geisinger Medical Center in Danville, Pennsylvania, joining us today. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, Dr. Azaredo, you are an otolaryngologist um, and a specialist in the field, and you and Jeff work together on the otolaryngology floor as a doctor and PT team um, with a really, really great approach to treating patients with vestibular dysfunction. So we're really, really excited to have you here um, and to kind of answer a couple of questions about your specialty and what you see on a daily basis. All right, Jeff, take it away. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Abby, for having us. Um, so the first question I wanted to propose to Dr. Azareta was for him to kind of inform our audience on what an otolaryngologist is. And within otolaryngology, are there specific subdivisions or specialties that um, perhaps would be more comfortable with dealing with a patient with vestibular related symptoms? Well, most people don't like saying otolaryngology, never mind the original otorhinolaryngology. So we're mainly known as ENT. Um, the focus, if you're dealing with vestibular disorders, would really be on the E rather than the N and the T. So uh, people who typically deal with dizziness issues involving um, peripheral, dis you know, obviously peripheral disorders would be either truly trained as otologists or neurotologists or generalists who have a, a distinct interest in the area and do it uh, quite frequently. Um, often we see patients in the balance center that are either referred directly from primary care physicians or other otolaryngologists. Very good. Um, within a general ENT physician community, approximately what percent of them do you feel have a strong interest in seeing a patient with a vestibular disorder? Uh, I, I think this is a niche field and most people um, are happy not to do this. Um, but I would say, you know, certainly if you're trying to refer a patient, I would be conscious of sending them to someone who typically does see them and has the infrastructure to be able to take care of them in terms of uh, equipment and not necessarily a balance center per se, because that's a unique situation to have for a lot of uh, community uh, hospitals or private practices, but you definitely want to see that they've seen dizzy patients before and, you know, and if when in doubt, ask around to your colleagues on where they've typically sent uh, um, patients to ENT in the past. One common thing that at least I hear from primary care and emergency room referrals is that a patient's presenting with dizziness related to an ear infection. It's not always really specified even what kind of ear infection they have. Can you go through the different types of infections that involve the ear and when should we be more concerned that an infection could cause vestibular symptoms as opposed to other situations where the suspicion would be lower? Well, to start, you, know, you would divide the ear uh, in a simple fashion as either shallow to the eardrum, uh, the middle ear is deep to the eardrum, and obviously the inner ear uh, constitutes the organs of hearing and balance. So if you had an inflammation or infection of the inner ear, that would definitely give rise to vertigo, and that would be a labyrinthitis. There are situations, though not common, where a middle ear infection uh, could give rise to extension into the labyrinth or inner ear. Um, and But that would, as I said, be uncommon, rarely bacterial. You'd usually think of it more viral. Um, and certainly if it were shallow to the eardrum, I can't think of any reasonable basis uh, to have a uh, 
patient be dizzy from having an outer ear infection unless there were gross extension and it was far beyond uh, an otitis externa, which is an infection of that region of the ear and truly be a case of skull base osteomyelitis. So in some situations, we see patients that present with hearing loss with their dizziness. Are there some bedside tips you would offer to help a therapist distinguish between whether a patient has a hearing loss related to their middle ear or what's called a conductive hearing loss versus a sensory neural hearing loss and some concerns you have with either? Well, unless you have a bedside, uh, you know, audiometry booth and uh, that sort of equipment, which is unlikely, your tuning fork is a great friend. Um, you know, I'm personally fond of the 512 hertz tuning fork, and certainly you would expect, so as a backup, I would recommend everybody have one if they're dealing with dizzy patients and being able to discern whether a patient's hearing loss, if they're complaining of it or you're finding it, is more likely or not to be conductive versus sensory neural. Um, so that's very helpful to perform a Weber and Renee test, which I imagine our target target audience has uh, performed Could you, before. I think it'd be good to review it briefly. Sure. That's okay. Absolutely. So with the uh, Weber, you place it on the forehead and ask a patient which ear it's louder in or whether it's midline. And if it were a conductive hearing loss, it should lateralize to the affected ear. You would be more concerned if it lateralized to the opposite ear um, because that would imply it was a sensory neural loss. And the Rene is you uh, place a tuning fork in front of the ear and then put it on the boniest spot you can find overlying the mastoid and essentially ask the patient which is louder, A or B, you know, A being in front of the ear, B behind, and um, it, that would help discern a degree of conductive loss. Right. So in those with a conductive hearing loss, they'll perceive it to be louder when it's placed behind their ear. If there's sufficient the conductive loss, roughly speaking, right. 25 decibels loss. Um, and if you don't have a tuning fork, which I've uh, mentioned to our residents if they're on the floor and get, oh, by the way, I have hearing loss, or I discovered with the uh, miracles of telemedicine during COVID, and you're talking to a patient on a screen who inconveniently does not have a 512 tuning fork at home. Um, I just, Which everyone I, should have. What's that? Everyone should have one, but go well, ahead. I, I <laughs> personally feel this way, but I, I admit I, I have a bias here, you know. Um, it basically, I have them hum in the ear. You know, if they say, I can't hear in my right ear, and I have them hum, if they hear their humming in their right ear, it's comforting because that would be associated with a conductive loss. Mm -hmm. You know, that's uh, if all else fails, you can always ask a patient to hum. I like that. Yeah. yeah I, I commonly have um, students when they're with me shove their finger, take their tragus, which is this hunk of cartilage in front of their ear, and shove it into their ear canal to impinge the canal and have them hum to themselves so you could do that yourself at home. And you'll notice that when you occlude your ear and you hum, you just swear you're humming towards that ear that has a, con a conductive hearing loss that you transiently created. So that can kind of help drive that point home. So it is really helpful for phone triage like Dr. Azzarato just mentioned. And it's a great trick any anytime you have a gathering of you know, socially distanced people. Well, it's good even if you're not if you're not um, fully equipped. If you're a PT at bedside, and you don't have an audiologist on hand. You know, across the hall like Jeff does. It's nice to be able to have that in your back pocket to at least screen your patients, and then recommend that they go see somebody if you're seeing them first. You know, first line of defense. So having that screen in your evaluation, I think, is really, really helpful, not only just for bedside evaluation of the dizzy patient, but anybody in general um, who might need to get corrective uh, uh, hearing aids or anything along those lines. One other helpful bedside test is just checking to see if hearing is intact to finger rub, because correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Azzarato, but I think a finger rub approximates like a four kilohertz uh, frequency stimuli at about 30 decibels. So you can see if hearing is intact, a finger rub, you know, left versus right. It's just a gross bedside screen. Yeah. 
as a word of warning, make sure you rub with the same vigorousness on both sides and the same distance away. You know, having it one inch away and then a foot away is not very accurate. Right. Yep. Good point. Um, are there any red flags that therapists should keep in mind if they do perform an otoscopic exam on a patient? So some potentially concerning things they could see with an otoscopic exam that should warrant referral to an otologist? Yeah, I would start by backing up and strongly recommending if you have an otoscope at your disposal, even if someone's not complaining of an ear problem and you're not suspicious, take a look at their ear. Not because I expect you to find anything, but to get used to what normal looks like and look at it over and over again. Because if you're able to tell the difference between normal and not normal, that's a very important step. One of the most rated, one of the most difficult things to discern in a human body is whether or not there's fluid behind the eardrum. Um, and that you would think would be one of more, the more simple pathologies. I'd also be very cautious to always make sure you document what you see and equally important what you don't see. Uh, in other words, if you have a patient and they have some wax smeared up against a portion of their eardrum, report it and say where within the, or excuse me, where on top of the eardrum it was covering and say that I couldn't see this portion of the eardrum because one of the concerns, and certainly this has happened when Jeff was concerned enough to bring a patient down the hall in the process of uh, lifting off the cerumen, we see they actually had a subjacent cholesteatoma. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to say everything looks normal if there's a portion you simply haven't seen. So that's a long-winded intro to saying, if there's something you can't see, have them see an otolaryngologist to make sure everything's okay. Now, do you think an otolaryngologist would be surprised if they had a report from a physical therapist that use an otoscope to look at the patient's, you know, ear canal and eardrum, would they have an issue with that? I mean, you and Jeff have a great relationship because you guys have worked together for many years and you've established trust. Um, do you think that, you know, if that was something Abby and I started doing in our clinic, that doctors would be receptive to that? Uh, or do you think they might have a problem with us doing that? I, I don't really think they problem. would. I mean, you're not, and now if you started to try and remove the wax, that would probably no. be met with resistance, but to, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just for, yeah, just you for will delete and this little portion where I'm hemming and hawing, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think, um, it, I, think it, I think it brings up a good point. You know, we're not looking to diagnose or treat right. anything that we see. We're merely saying that taking a look at it superficially just to see what either normal is or have any sort of red flags is just a screening process to then refer on if needed. All right, then I'll uh, let me answer it without the ums and huhs. <laughs> I, I think it would be welcomed by the type of person you would want to send your patient to. <laughs> I like that answer. Yeah, that that is. If it, I think it would also reflect well, and over time, I know there's certainly people where initially I was like, oh, that's funny, as an aside, that they would send me a cochlear implant patient. They aren't an audiologist. And some of these people, I realize their acumen is fantastic. And what they send almost inevitably is something that needs to be dealt with. So even if initially somebody were a little bit off put, they wouldn't be for long, if, especially if what you were sending them was important to rule out an underlying process. So I like that. One thing that's helped Jeff, in our practice. Oh, go ahead, Ivy. I was going to ask, do you regularly do that in your clinic? Every patient. Yeah, I have so to say, of the I've never been somewhere that has. I didn't used to, but um, one thing is, is I work at a multidisciplinary clinic, and sometimes I'm the only patient they see, and I don't feel good about them coming in and out, even if they're there for just BPPB, to have not at least briefly Jeff, scoped I know their that ears. You're a patient but they're not seeing you the patient they're the patient just so you know <laughs> i guess i misspoke um but I, given the nature of our center i feel like i'm i don't like to miss things that come in i don't want to find out three years later that when the patient was here they had a cholesteatoma we didn't see even though we were seeing them for a different reason i think one thing that can help too is if you see a patient who has a fair amount of debris in each year or cerumen is if 
if there is a local ENT practice that has PA providers, sometimes that can be a helpful um, referral to the PA for them to remove the cerumen and screen it. And then if there is a more concerning finding, they would pass it on to the otologist. So that can be a good use of it. Uh, I'm talking about a PA that's dedicated to ENT, um, which we have at our center. Yeah, you guys have a really great, unique setup that I think everybody who specializes in this field wish they had because you've got everything on one floor under one roof and anybody that pops up a little bit funky can get a lot more answers that day. Um, so I, I, I really respect what you guys have set up and built over the years, even down to the triage of when somebody calls into the center, they get triaged by the front desk who directs them to most likely the correct person that they need to see, which I think is huge when it comes to cutting down diagnosis time and getting the help they need. So you guys definitely are running a good show up there. Dr. Azareta, could you... Do. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jeff, but I was just going no, to go, go ahead. It certainly goes the other way. I'll often have a patient where they have an asymmetric hearing loss and, you know, they're elderly. So the fact that they feel off balance doesn't tell me a whole heck of a lot. And I'll get a vestibular exam and that will help guide me whether or not I feel it's reasonable to just get a follow up audiogram in six, nine months or whether I'm going to get an MRI. So certainly the benefit is the other way as well to ensure that patients get as full of an answer as they could within one day at the, within the balance center or ENT. Earlier you had mentioned cholesteatoma um, and in just my experience, I've encountered them several times um, and they were unrecognized prior to coming into our clinic. Could you explain to our audience exactly what a cholesteatoma is? Cause I think the term's a little misleading. Um, and what are some dangers associated with it? Sure, I'll try and keep it simple. Um, but to start with, the name is a complete misnomer. It would mean a cholesterol fat-filled tumor. There's no cholesterol in it. There's no fat in it, and it's not a tumor. So it's strictly an 0 for 3. In baseball, it would be a strikeout. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, it's essentially an acquired cholesteatoma. Uh, for the majority of purposes, starts with a deeply retracted eardrum, uh, particularly in the pars flaccida portion where it doesn't have the stiffening layer. It's just a, a epithelial layer and mucosal layer. Um, and once you have a deep retraction of the eardrum, the outer surface sloughing off skin debris, it tends to collect rather than make its way out and become uh, the base of what cerumen is. And once it starts to collect, it starts to function as a cyst of sloughed off skin with the capacity to expand. And as it does, it breaks down the surrounding bone and in that way behaves like a, a, a benign tumor regionally by destroying the surrounding substances. And uh, that would give rise to, as they expand and destroy things, hearing loss, vertigo. Uh, erosion of the bone covering the facial nerve and uh, erosion of the bone separating the middle ear space and mastoid from uh, the skull base. And if infected, it does it faster. So it's an important thing to recognize. It's not a uh, elective surgery. It's a necessary surgery to remove what it. There's, it's a, there's no medical solution for a cholesteatoma. Can you briefly mention what they look like when you're so when you're scoping an ear? What do you see that raises your concern that uh, I need to look at this further? Mm. Well, oftentimes the concern is if you have wax hung up on the eardrum and on the surface, it can just look like wax. So if you see wax accumulated uh, in pars flaccida, like in that superior portion to where the malleus sits. If you're not as comfortable with the ear anatomy um, or posteriorly, superiorly, you see the eardrum sucked in and you can't see the base of it, then that would be concerning. Uh, if the classic description, if you look at a photograph online or in a textbook, is that it would have a uh, white appearance like you would expect sloughed off skin to. But it's yeah. often covered. So you don't necessarily see that when you're just looking at them initially. 
So I think one of the take-home points is, is if you see debris pasted right on somebody's tympanic membrane, be more concerned than if you see the debris more peripherally in the ear. It's a simplified way to look at it. Yes. Is there a is there a general progression of cholesteatomas? Is there a certain timeline that you can expect to see symptoms, or is it different from person to person? It's different growth rates. It also depends on, like I mentioned, whether it's infected or not. Infected cholesteatomas tend to destroy bone faster. I've certainly inherited patients who um, have had them ostensibly for 15 years or so, and they haven't done as much damage as I would have expected. And I've had other people who've had them for 15 years unattended to, and it's eroded through the bone of the skull base, through the posterior fossa, and into the labyrinth itself. So... Um, there's no specific timeline. It's not usually a surgical emergency unless you see specific symptoms associated with it, but it's not something that should be let go and they should, they should be seen in a timely manner by uh, ENT. Okay, let's move on to Meniere's disease a little bit, um, which, you know, it's hard to encapsulate this in a, in a podcast, but can you just go over some common misconceptions with Meniere's disease, and then also briefly touch on treatments that are available for Meniere's disease that an otologist would commonly offer? It, it's easiest to kind of consider how many things mimic Meniere's and how many things people think can cause Meniere's and have literally nothing to do with it. I've certainly had patients who've been told that their sinus infection, should they actually have one, is the cause of their Meniere's disease. Um, and, and that's really not possible. Um, you know, I've had people who've had BPPV and they've been told that they had Meniere's disease. Those are things that should be more obviously, you know, not causative or associated. At the same time, you know, the big overlap would be with uh, a vestibular variant migraine. And there are some people who can obviously have both, but I definitely have come to believe the statistic I learned at a, as a resident that the actual proportion of people who have Meniere's versus the, those who've been tagged as having Meniere's is probably about one in 10. Um, see many people diagnosed with it peripherally in their charts and you ask them, who diagnosed this? What were your symptoms? Like, oh, well, I was dizzy when I bent over. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. So commonly overdiagnosed, commonly misdiagnosed, um, yeah. and it can go hand in hand with other different types of vestibular dysfunction, like vestibular migraine or a secondary form of BPPV. BPPV as well. Sure. I mean, I was almost biting my tongue when I said it wouldn't be associated with BPPV because, of course, indirectly, Meniere sufferers are more likely to have BPPV. But uh, I mean, literally mistaking BPPV and uh, Meniere's disease. As far as, uh, does that answer? Yeah, and, well, just briefly, what are some differentiating features from a history that make you think more, okay, this is more likely Meniere's versus migraine? Sure, well, um, one misconception about migraine is that you have to have a migraine at the same time, uh, which is rarely actually the case. But if you have anybody who's had a migraine-like headache during their vestibular episode, that certainly would have to be on the differential. You wouldn't expect somebody who has vestibular variant migraines to have associated audiologic symptoms with their episodes or unilateral audiologic symptoms independent of their episodes that you would expect with Meniere's disease, the oral fullness, the tinnitus, the low frequency hearing loss. Um, with Meniere's, obviously you would expect those and you want to see uh, fluctuation in that hearing loss, at least early on in the course of the disease. The intensity is often fairly different. Um, you would expect it to be much more intense and debilitating with Meniere's disease and certainly bothersome, but rarely uh, debilitating or as debilitating if someone was having a vestibular variant migraine. And the problem is, of course, the sweet spot in the overlap in terms of length of attacks, they're very similar. So that it's a common um, sort of dichotomy of which one is it when a patient hasn't fully 
you know, bend into a particular diagnosis and it's early on in the disorder. And that's where audiological testing is really important, correct? To be able to have a track history of looking at this patient over time and, and monitoring audiograms and whatnot. Oh, absolutely. And the obvious is the vestibular testing with the irony being that early on in the disease in between episodes, certainly a VNG at least can be uh, totally normal. And nonetheless, they have Meniere's disease. Okay. Um, what, what are some common treatments that are employed for Meniere's disease um, that a patient may encounter from an otologist? Sure. I think uh, the vast majority of people would start patients off with uh, lifestyle modifications, the most common of which would be a, a true low salt diet, which uh, depending on where you live may be uh, quite difficult for the patient if they're used to a very high salt diet. Um, and uh, usually a diuretic, typically diazide, with a rough estimate that two thirds of patients will do well enough with a combination like that, that they don't uh, need further treatment. And of course, the end goal of treatment is the cessation of attacks of vertigo. So you do what you need to do to stop the attacks and keep it at that. And since you don't know if it will ever kick in again or certainly whether you could have a quiet period in the course of the disease and it be an epiphenomenon that you started them on a low salt diet and they got better, you tend to need to follow these patients for the duration at least once a year or so. Uh, if that's not successful for the one third or so who fail, as a lot of people um, have taken to using intratympanic steroid injections in the affected ear, clearly in this situation, you need to know which ear is involved. Um, otherwise, if you pick the wrong ear, it wouldn't have much benefit. Um, at this center, I certainly inherited a lot of patients who are on Histotrol, uh, and the PO version of that is beta histine or CERC, uh, used often in Canada and in Europe to uh, oddly similar degree of success in looking at the numbers of people who didn't need further treatment that I inherited here in Danville. Uh, I find it more useful in a situation if I feel like their attacks are really disrupting their lives, but I'm not sure which year it is yet, and, they're, and or they're reluctant to undergo an intratympanin in, injection of steroids. Um, most uh, losing traction, I would say, but still used quite often is uh, intratympanic genomycin injections, which has a higher success rate than either of those two treatments, depending obviously on which study you uh, read. It's a significantly higher percentage and that would be functionally the last uh, medical step that you would take uh, the other options for treatment, which in the modern era are really not common relative to uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, the others would be surgical options. Uh, we'll move on to, I just wanted to briefly talk about superior canal dehiscence. Can you briefly review the common symptoms patients have with that and what the, uh, management of that disorder would be. So what are some things therapists should listen for to hone into that disorder? And then just briefly, how is it managed? Well, I would say there obviously, um, I'm sure most of the people listening have heard of this disorder and are aware that it's a diagnosis that's basically been around for 23 years or so. And people are still learning the nuances of symptoms and, uh, the processes to better evaluate it and what treatments would be. Um, the, the more common symptoms include autophony, increased appreciation of visceral noise. Uh, on an audiogram, you get this uh, pseudoconductive hearing loss on the affected side or sides. Uh, the symptom wise, you get some patients will feel quote unquote dizzy with loud noises or with bearing down, uh, wearing um, non-rubber-soled shoes on a linoleum floor. Would they, I've had patients complain it reverberates up to their ear. They feel like everything's hollow. Their ears feel plugged up. It's uh, 
can be an extremely annoying uh, smorgasbord of symptoms. And not everybody has all of these, um, but among the more common are the autophony and the oral fullness. Uh, briefly, the mechanism for the disorder and then how it's managed. Sure, it's a uh, it's a third window disease. It's it's basically functionally you have uh, two functional windows to get energy in and out of the inner ear uh, through the oval window and the round window. And when you have a dehiscence uh, between the superior semicircular canal and when the skull base and the uh, intracranial space, um, you have a third way to get energy in and out of there functionally. And that through complicated series of reasonings gives rise to the uh, symptoms that people experience. Good management? Well, unfortunately there is no medical management. It's uh, strictly a surgical problem. Um, in my experience, probably about half of patients, maybe slightly less, it bothers them sufficiently where they want to proceed with a surgery uh, to basically plug and cap the dehiscence. Um, yeah, that's a, and I think that's uh, fairly universally true. And there are some patients that come in and initially are glad to know what it is and say, that's fine. Glad to know, but I want to be left alone. I said, okay, we'll call us if it gets worse. And later on, they sometimes circle back and wish to have something done about it. But it's a, it's a uh, unfortunately fairly invasive procedure to correct it involving either a transmastoid or a middle fossa approach to plug and cap the dehiscence. Um, briefly, vestibular schwannoma, when should a therapist be concerned about that? Um, when is therapy appropriate for it? Just some comments on it. Mm, that last question, I actually think you'd be uh, more appropriate to ask the question than I, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, when would you be worried about it? Anytime there's an asymmetric hearing loss, it should uh, somewhere enter the equation of possibilities. Even in a patient who is reliable and doesn't feel like they hear in one ear well at all, and yet their audiogram doesn't really support that well. That actually is quite concerning for a retrocochlear lesion, but uh, asymmetric hearing loss, a unilateral tinnitus, uh, particularly in terms of vestibular symptoms, somebody who has uh, vestibulopathy without a prior crisis event and has slowly worsened over time plus or minus the same time frame that they've had the hearing loss would definitely get one's hackles up and should be referred. Right. We, when we talk about a vestibular crisis event, that means an attack of vertigo with nausea and vomiting and debility. So when you have a patient who just has a unilateral vestibular loss but has no recall ever of having an acute attack of vertigo, that at our center is one of the concerns for investigating for these. Although even in that subsection of patients, we don't find them that often, but I think it's concerning enough that we look for that. Um, with an audiogram, are there any specific traits of an audiogram that make you more concerned that a patient may have a vestibular schwannoma versus not? Pure well, tone, obvious, closer speed. Sure. Um, obviously, you know, if, as I told you, if I, when I trained, if and since about a, 20% of my training was at a VA. If I had got an MRI on every single patient at asymmetric hearing loss, mm -hmm. uh, it would totally bankrupt the system because they all do, because they all fired rifles and they're all veterans. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you try and have a clinical picture of this patient and the amount of hearing loss, whether it makes sense. And it's either way, it wouldn't be something I would ignore. I would either get follow-up audiograms or if I have more concern, uh, or if the patient has underlying concerns and just wants an answer, I would get an MRI. So it all it depends in part in terms of the hearing where in the range it is. An asymmetry at low frequency will bother me a lot more than that same relatively mild asymmetry in the noise range of hearing loss or presbyacusis. Um, additionally, uh, 
I think what you were getting at, which is under well known but less common, is if you have a mismatch between the pure tone audiogram and the speech to scrim scores, that would uh, get your hackles up that it's a retrocochlear lesion. And there's a, a specific type of MRI that you would order to look at this a little bit more closely. Is that correct? Right. Um, what I wouldn't want to have happen is come in with an MRI of the brain without contrast, because that essentially won't answer the question. The benefit of an MRI is that we get very fine detail, but that's best served by getting an MRI of the internal auditory canals with and without contrast. How helpful is a CT? Um, about as helpful as spraying Windex on the ear. <laughs> <laughs> and this should be something that, that uh, clinicians do keep an ear out for. I mean, in, in the just a couple of years that I've been practicing, uh, six or seven now, I found three. Three that were missed by initially, um, you know, ENTs or physicians or people that just came in, you know, first line of defense uh, to the physical therapist because they were having vestibular issues. Um, that three in a couple of years is a significant amount and getting them to the right person can be helpful. So you got to make sure you make friends with your audiologists and your ENTs in the area because you have to have a multidisciplinary approach to get people to where they need to go. To uh, answer your question, honestly, Jeff, a CT scan isn't nearly as helpful because the resolution to be able to see a vestibular schwannoma is such that it would already have to be medium to large before you would likely be able to see it. And the resolution is that much finer with an MRI. Um, so the only time we would ever get a CT scan is if we physically can't get an MRI, as in if a patient has a pacemaker, which precludes getting an MRI or a cochlear implant, but hopefully someone would have already gotten an MRI before they put in a cochlear implant. But basically that, specific reason why they have something inside them that precludes us getting an MRI. So we're stuck getting a CT scan. And if their hearing isn't bad enough yet, yet we get a uh, site of lesion ABR, you know, we go back in time to before MRIs were as good as they are. Right. Um, Are there situations where when a therapist is seeing a patient with a unilateral vestibular loss, in other words, they've done testing at bedside and feel pretty comfortable that the patient's unsteady due to vestibular hypofunction unilaterally, are there situations where you think further medical in investigation is more indicated than other situations? Like what would be some clues that that patient needs to be referred on versus just being treated with therapy? You mean someone with a unilateral vestibulopathy? Is that what you're asking me? Or? Right, yeah. Well, again, Indica what you, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, just indications that eh, there might be something a little bit more sinister going on or something that requires further medical workup. Well, obviously, if someone has associated uh, unilateral hearing loss, that would be a uh, big issue. You know, we don't routinely get MRIs if we think somebody has a vestibular neuritis. If someone has a vestibular neuritis, excuse me, neuritis, we wouldn't expect them to have any hearing loss in that year. And yet, if we have somebody with a presumptive labyrinthitis, we're getting an MRI. Right. So that's certainly the first thing I would worry about. And then anybody who has a slowly worsening um, insidious onset vestibulopathy without, as we talked about before, a prior crisis event, that would be concerning um, because obviously a neuritis is a crisis event. Yeah, I think two other things that we commonly talk about at our center too would be lack of functional improvement, like the patient just keeps worsening, even though you really don't see any other reason why they should be unsteady. And then a third one that I've, I think therapists should be aware of, especially with schwannoma, is if the patient's complaining of exertional vertigo, brief episodes of intense dizziness with exertion. There's a very useful test called a hyperventilation test. And if you see hyperventilation induces nystagmus beating towards the side of the hypofunction, that would be Another reason you might want to consider referring that patient out, even though they just appear to have unilateral vestibular loss. All right. Well, 
I think I hit on the questions I had, Danielle. Do you have any other questions for Dr. Esri? Uh, well, first of all, how long have you guys been working together with the multidisciplinary approach at the Balance Center? When did this come about? Because I think it's really important to hammer home the importance of having a multidisciplinary approach to patients, because very rarely is somebody just going to be able to, you need to have multiple people looking at this um, in order to give people the help that they need, it seems like to me. So how long have you guys um, been working at the Balance Center or taking this multidisciplinary approach? When did this all get started? Jeff? Sure, I'll take this one. Well, I came to Guy Singer in 1999. And for the first approximately 10 years, I worked on my own within a rehab department and under a different roof was ENT and audiology. And so we tried to work together, but we weren't in the same location and coordination of care was very difficult. So we started a balance center about so 12 years about ago. 12 years ago. Yeah, 12 years ago. And so in the same hallway, we have audiology, vestibular rehab, and um, ENT otology. And I can't tell you how much, I, I think the care patients receive is far more coordinated, prompt, effective. Um, I get a lot more satisfaction out of helping patients in this sort of setting. So I, th I think really with these patients having those relationships, I mean, ideally, if it's under one roof, that's great. But if, you, if you're not in that situation, at least developing those relationships is, is really important. And I felt very fortunate because I work with Dr. Azaredo and several other otologists, and we all really get along well and respect each other. And um, Dr. Azaredo is very, very, very thorough, and I like his approach, and he He's very good at not missing things. And also he's a student at realizing patients can have more than one problem. And a lot of times they'll be seeing a patient he's treated for a cochlear implant as an example, and they'll be complaining of some post-operative dizziness. And instead of just assuming it's just from some trauma from the surgery, he'll investigate to see if it's a hypofunction or a secondary BPPV. And if it's a secondary, secondary BPV, get it treated. So I really, I've enjoyed working with him because he's very thorough and he makes no assumptions like he investigates things. Do we have answers if we can find them? I think as a going to you guys as a student, when I did my 10 week clinical with you, I was extremely spoiled in the fact that I came into something and I assumed that this was uh, the same across the board, you know, across the country. But, um, you know, getting to work with both of you and the audiology department there, it made me realize how important, you know, audiology is for these vestibular patients and getting them to the right ENT or otolaryngologist is really important. And having a functional team where you can kind of get that patient full 360 care is, is largely important for proper diagnosis, fast diagnosis, and getting these patients taken care of in a, in a quick manner. Um, it definitely opened up my eyes to working more closely wherever I moved from, whether it was Virginia or Maryland or South Carolina, now Georgia, you know, always establishing who in the area can I trust and refer to and is going to take care of these patients because it is rare to have some things work well together like the, like the way that you guys do. So I think it's amazing the, the dream yeah. team that you guys have put together up there because it really makes a huge difference in these patients' lives. Um, for some people, it takes them years to get a proper diagnosis and to get treated uh, correctly. Um, so you guys cut that down significantly. I think another um, positive attribute of having a center like this is getting the patients prompt appropriate care. Like, um, we can have a fairly good idea what may be wrong with the patient if we have a decently written clinic note that comes in with the patient's referral. And so, you know, if we have a patient that pretty clearly has BPPV, we can channel them towards seeing me. If we have a patient with an acute hearing loss, they need to see Dr. Azareo. So channeling the patient in the right direction promptly, um, I think really helps with efficiency of care. Um, just for example, speaking for Dr. Azaredo, he doesn't really want on his clinic schedule someone who's coming to the clinic who has chronic imbalance from peripheral neuropathy. Like that's something we can sort out sort of with just a good thorough vestibular exam in the, in the context of vestibular rehab and possibly not have that patient take up a spot on his schedule. So I think it helps us both ways to see the type of patients that we can help um, in a prompt manner.
and, and there are multiple. That's, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Dr. Ritz. Ultimately, it's just better patient care because a patient's frustrated if they come to see, you know, an ear surgeon and the ear surgeon basically says, well, your problem's not your ear. And they're like, well, they don't care. They just want to get better or at least know what the problem is. So um, it's nice for to have things more streamlined for the patient's sake. Um, ideally, also, we would have a neurological wing that would deal with central etiologies, have that be um, a, a more obvious pathway, but um, that that would be something to build on in that situation. But I think the other benefit is if there's you know something as simple as come in and the VNG doesn't look right, we can have it changed or we can talk about it and see whether we want to repeat it that day rather than have it be sent out and then another iteration of visit and patients drive, which can be quite a distance. So again, getting back to um, better patient care and feeling like they get an answer faster than they might in other situations. Fairly, this can be duplicated, you know, it, even if people aren't under the same umbrella, it's just a, requires more communication and a bit more time. Yeah. yeah. You find a lot of these balanced uh, centers where there is a multidisciplinary approach just in larger areas or teaching hospitals. Like there's one at MUS, uh, MUSC uh, um, up in Charleston. There's uh, Chicago. There's Atlanta. There's some in L.A. You know, some of these bigger cities have them, but the ac people don't have that access to care, you know, everywhere. So telemedicine has definitely helped with that. But I think also educating clinicians like uh, vestibular physical therapists on, on how to build a team and improve communication between uh, different uh, disciplines in the field is important um, to help help their patients. So I appreciate all the work that you guys have put into what you've created and especially taking the time to talk with us today. Um, I think this is going to be a great episode that people are going to be very excited to listen to. Well, thanks for having us. Nice to see you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And you guys are welcome back anytime. So I'm hoping we'll get you guys back on a future episode here, uh, not too far away. Okay. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Dr. Ezra. If you're interested in finding us on social media or the web, you can visit www.vestibular.today for more resources, including testing, treatment, and educational videos blogs, continuing education classes, and resources including clinic equipment recommendations, suggested tests, and BPBB treatment charts. Search Vestibular Today and Balancing Neck Rehab on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, be sure to check out Balancing Act Rehab at www.balancingactrehab.com, especially if you think you would benefit from vestibular therapy. We are your girls. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace the care provided by your qualified health professional or to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on Talk Dizzy to Me. Please contact us at Balancing Act Rehab if you think you could benefit from vestibular therapy.